So good morning, I'm Dr. Diane Gardner, one of the directors on the Programme Grant Management Board for the Resilient Materials for Life uh, Programme Grant. And this morning, my colleagues and I would like to give you um, an overview of, of our own role of, of the actual project, including a little bit about the project itself, and then some of the things we've perhaps been doing over the last, last few years. So first of all, I'd like to start by, by sort of saying who we are, who, 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 is, who comprises the research team. We are about 18 investigators, um, so that's academic staff, 15 research staff, and about 20 PhD students who, who are associated with the programme grant, but perhaps funded from, from a variety of sources. I say about because that's just a snapshot in time. Obviously, you can appreciate with, with such a long programme grant, people have, have, have come and have joined and have moved on to pastures new. We are very gratefully supported by our, um, our industrial partners, of whom there are, are lots of people to mention, so I won't pick out anyone in particular, but they're all on the screen in front of you. And also our external scientific board and our industrial advisory board, who respectively um, help guide us on our scientific progress and also help to make sure that uh, the, the technologies and, and the work that we're doing is relevant to, to industry practice and, and to be able to adopt, be adopted in the long term. As Bob's already mentioned, um, we, and as many of you know, you know, there are a lot of structures out there that are still susceptible to damage. They still suffer from, uh, from cracking and the need to develop resilient structures whilst being prudent with our natural resources has never been more pressing. Indeed, ever since drafting the original um, RM4L project in 2016, the landscape surrounding climate change has changed quite significantly. And as a research consortium, we had and we still have this, this ambition that by 2050, we can achieve um, a sustainable and resilient built environment and infrastructure comprising materials and structures that continually monitor, regulate, adapt and repair themselves without the need for external intervention. RM4L in its inception was a key enabler of this ambition with its own vision of achieving by the end of the project, a transformation in construction materials using this biomimetic approach that will allow them to adapt to their environment, develop self-immunity and immunity to harmful actions, self-diagnose the onset of deterioration and also self-heal when damaged. And it's this innovative research that we've been working on in smart materials that will hopefully engender this step change um, in value that's placed on, on our infrastructure. In terms of how we've organised ourselves, well, um, there's a slide that you can all see now, hopefully. We have uh, four main research themes uh, upon which draw we draw from the, the four main technologies that we've been looking at. So, so self-diagnosing technologies, self-healing technologies, our scaling up and our modelling and our tailoring technologies. And these are then crossed by our series of applications. So we're looking at ways in which we can develop our systems to target specific applications. We then have, in terms of content of each of our research themes, we, as you see, there's research theme one. Each of the Programme Grant Management Board is leading uh, one of the research uh, themes. So we have, first of all, self-healing cracks at multiple scales, whereby we're really looking at uh, developing a suite of technologies um, in that we can use to, to explore and, and in which we explore some fundamentally new ideas of self-healing technologies that we've considered in our previous research uh, projects. Uh, research theme two, led by Tony, we're looking at developing or looked at developing self-diagnosing, self-healing systems to prevent or mitigate uh, damage from both long and short-term intrinsic and extrinsic time-dependent actions. Research theme three, uh, led by Kevin, uh, we have our primary aim to develop truly biometric self-diagnosing and self-healing materials that require no human intervention and to develop highly resilient uh, concrete that self-strengthens prior to damage. And our research team four led by a beer at Cambridge, whereby we're looking at the ability of systems to self-diagnose and act appropriately against chemical damage um, and, and damage triggers that, that um, you know, we can respond to both in the method of self-immunization uh, to prevent damage and also self-healing once damage has occurred. So as you can imagine, the scale of work that we have, we've had to work collaboratively across the whole project. And that's not only in the development of the individual technologies where each one of the universities in turn has been, uh, you know, uh, have been working collaboratively in developing, you know, some of the vascular networks or the crack closure techniques to now the integration of different technologies in the different systems. So for perhaps as an example is the use of the self-sensing and the crack closure system that Cardiff, Bath and Bradford are now working on. 
as a group, we've been involved in this uh, interlaboratory testing, not only amongst ourselves, but also with external academic partners as part of the wider networks that RM4L is involved in. And then we're all coming together yet again to, to, to look at the field trials with our industry partners um, to be able to show, you know, the success of these technologies at scale. So really, you know, we, we couldn't have achieved what we've achieved so far without all working together and, and pulling in the same direction towards that 2050 ambition and our 2022 vision uh, for the for the programme. So that's a little snapshot of what the uh, the programme grant is all about. I just want to now give you a flavour of the sort of research that we've been doing specifically at Cardiff University, uh, mainly on the experimental work, but on vascular networks, cargoes and, and some novel polymer reinforcement. We've spent, uh, as have Cambridge University, quite a lot of time in developing one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional uh, networks that, um, you know, we can create via, via printed uh, polymer elements, whether we leave them or, or leave them in situ or whether we remove them. But we've had quite good success from, from being able to load these um, vascular networks with our healing cargoes. We've been able to flush them out. We've been able to damage and, and, and get some healing and also to recharge these systems um, again. So, you know, we're really looking now when we're thinking about vascular networks, about, about the next stage, about, about creating these at larger scale. Though we have had some uh, good success at our medium sized scale up in terms of our slabs and and some of our wall elements. Now, one of the things that's, that we have to be mindful of when we're looking at, at closed loop systems, and I should just mention that on the slide at the time, you'll see some boxes with RT1s and WP5s. That's just showing where we, where we sort of branch across the different research themes and the different work packages. So when we're thinking about, um, say, these closed loop systems in vascular networks, we really, um, you know, want to make sure we have sufficient pressure to drive our healing agents into the zones of damage, because often capillary, um, capillary force alone is insufficient. So we've done some studies looking at, you know, what's the influence of pressure, what's the influence of, of damage rate on how successful, how, 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 how efficient our healing can be. And we've actually achieved a, a stage whereby we can actually heal um, damage uh, simultaneously as damage is occurring, which is really useful for things like dynamic uh, damage scenarios. And we've also confirmed the pressure of not only pressurizing the healing agent, being able to find up that optimum pressure for different types of crack and also different uh, crack widths. To overcome some of the problems that we've had with, with this uh, release of healing agents, we've looked at uh, developing some novel mini vascular networks, as you see them on the screen. These are 3D printed tetrahedral units. And the notion is that when a crack is formed, it, 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 it cuts through two of the ligaments and as such, there's sufficient driving force to drive that healing agent out into the, into the crack. Now, again, we've had some success, quite good success with sort of cycles of this healing using something you know, traditional like a sodium silicate. Um, and then, you know, when we're looking at other healing agents, it is giving us some challenges with regards to compatibility. So we're looking at different printed materials for our networks. We're looking at our different cargoes, different printing um, parameters to, to ensure um, that we can uh, encapsulate healing agents uh, for longer. And I know that um, there's a talk on Wednesday afternoon whereby we look at the sort of next generation of these mini vascular networks. Obviously, we're very mindful of scale up, so we have to make sure that we can um, produce these units at scale. And if we want to move away from 3D printing techniques, we're looking at alternative forms of these uh, tetrahedral units that we can create uh, perhaps on a line scale in terms of, um, you know, being able to, to fold them, to bend them. Alongside that, we have our, our cargoes. So as you can imagine, we've uh, studied quite a wide range of cargoes. Um, those with strong healing abilities, such as our cyanoacrylates, to those with um, that combat chemical deterioration, such as our, the green corrosion inhibitors that Cambridge University have been looking at. Um, we've tried and tested cargoes and their ability to be encapsulated for long periods, their ability to flow, to react, to yield good bonding strength um, within our required timescales. And looking at modified um, versions of cyanoacrylates and nanosilica and nanolines, we're really moving in the right direction in terms of getting that encapsulation and duration of encapsulation that we need. 
One of the other alternatives that we're looking at is these expansive agents, so we can hold them within our, our networks and, and using catalyst particles that are distributed within the concrete or cementitious matrix that will help our, our, our polymers, our, our healing or sealing agents to, to react at speed, to fill a crack, which we can then use some other techniques as our, our crack closure techniques um, to address the recovery of strength if we so need. And, and our most recent work will include the use of um, you know the, the bacterial work that uh, Bath are conducting with our vascular network such that we can either afford protection to the bacteria in situ or perhaps supply nutrients um, to the bacteria uh, through the vascular network route. We have as a, a different strand of our work our novel polymer systems um, and we work quite closely with Bradford University um, on the development of these. And the first is our, our shape memory polymer Kevlar tendons. And these comprise a, a strong Kevlar core, which is held, uh, placed within tension within a PET uh, shape memory polymer sleeve. This outer sleeve constrains the pre-stress core until it's activated via heating. And at which point the tensile preload stored in the core and the shrinkage potential of the PET sleeve are released. And obviously when these ten tendons are placed within a, a, a concrete beam or a mortar beam, that then transfers and results in a, a compressive force applied to the structural element, which we can use to close uh, any cracks that occur perpendicular to the tendon. And we found um, that we can generate sufficient pre-stress uh, when we have a certain area of tendon to close our serviceability limit state cracks, um, which, are, which is absolutely fantastic news. And, you know, uh, we're developing the next sort of um, form of these now to look at different activation techniques and also anchorage of the, of the tendons and, and working uh, quite closely with Bradford again on that. And again, I know there's perhaps a, a talk on that on, on Wednesday afternoon. Along a similar sort of line, instead of our macro cracks that we're looking at with our SMP Kevlar, we've got our micro cracked um, version of our SMP knotted fibres. So these are small fibres with, with small anchorages on the end in the form of knots that we can place in a beam, activate with heat. And then again, we get about 77% uh, crack closure on average of our specimens that we've tested. So again, just different forms, different uh, levels of damage that we can address with our different polymer techniques. And the final one really is the development of novel uh, tetrahedron reinforcement. And again, I won't steal anyone's thunder from Wednesday afternoon, but this is a, a new um, tetrahedral form of reinforcement that um, we can use together with other techniques to, to afford a self-healing uh, ability. And again, we've looked quite closely at the form of these in terms of being able to scale them up, produce them uh, in quite significant volumes. And luckily we've been able to do that. And that, that's very um, useful and, and positive for when we move towards the larger scale um, tests that we're going to conduct. And together with these sort of crack closure techniques, we need to have a mix which is really efficient in autogenic healing, you know, a huge autogenic healing potential. So looking at our standard mixes with our common cement replacement materials that will allow us to have autogenic healing perhaps at different ages to perhaps uh, maximize it at early age or to have sufficient in reserve for, for later scale uh, damage when we, um, when we need that healing action. I've spoken a lot about experimental work that we're doing at Cardiff, but you know, a, a significant string to our bow is is our experimental uh, data that feeds into the finite element modelling and numerical simulations. Now, I'm by no means the best person to speak about this, and and Tony will tell you some of this uh, numerical modelling work that we've been doing uh, towards the end of this presentation. And finally, from me, before I hand on. Um, I just want to say thanks to our team here in Cardiff. Um, without you, we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we've been able to achieve so far. Um, and also, also, you know, our external collaborators who perhaps aren't, you know, official partners on the grant, but um, have, have been there supporting us in the development of our novel ideas. So that's really a snapshot of Cardiff's work and an overview of the programme. And now I'd like to hand on to Abir, uh, Professor Abir Al-Tabar from Cambridge University, who will give you a little bit of an overview about their activities. Great, thank you very much, Di. I would like to present a very quick overview uh, using actually mainly pictures of the work we've been doing at Cambridge here as part of RM4L. So I'm going to cover some of the materials and the products we've developed, their synthesis and development, laboratory testing, field trials, and then commercial deployment, and then finish with just a little bit about our future plans.
Okay, so here's a collection of a number of the materials and products that we've been working on. And they span across all the four research themes that Di mentioned uh, within RM4L. So we've been exploring self-healing against physical damage, self-healing against cyclic damage, self-sensing, and self-immunization and self-healing against chemical damage. And we've been working on different cementitious systems, so soil cement systems, grout, mortar, and concrete. And so we've been looking at different applications as well as different damage scenarios. So if we look at those in sort of particular groups and starting from left to right, so we've been exploring a range of mineral additives and inclusions, for example, expansive minerals and crystalline admixtures for crack closure and layer double hydroxides and zeolites in calcine functionalized and intercalated forms for self-immunization against corrosion. We've also been looking at carbon uh, based materials, graphite, graphene, carbon nanotubes, and a range of fiber composites, mainly for self-sensing applications. And then we come to the large group of capsules, which is probably the area where we've done most of our work. So we have macro capsules with impregnated and coated lightweight aggregates, and also superabsorbent polymers or saps. On the micro capsules front, we have produced some from a number of different fabrication techniques with both mineral and organic cargo and shell materials, and for both physical and chemical trigger. We focus on sodium metasilicate and other silica-based cargo for physical damage and oils, natural and mineral-based compounds as corrosion inhibitors for chemical damage. For the vascular networks uh, work that Dai is already referred to, we mainly use 3D printing of both polymer and cement configurations, and we've explored designs based on Murray's law for flow in blood vessels. Usually for the selection, comparisons and optimizations of cargo, we've tended to start with large glass or 3D printed tubes for ease of fabrication or just test them in poor solutions. We're also implement, implementing uh, the use of conventional and novel sensors to monitor in situ performance. A focus for us has been on sensors for early age warning of the onset of corrosion. Obviously, each material and product system will have its own manufacturing approaches and therefore associated uh, scale up challenges. So, we've been exploring different chemical synthesis approaches, pelletization, freeze drying, microfluidics, interfacial polymerization, and membrane emulsification, just to name a few techniques. I would particularly like to acknowledge the collaboration and support we received from Lamson and Dolomite, and most extensively from Micropore with whom we have been scaling up a range of microcapsules. In terms of embedment within the cementitious matrices, this vary depending on the product and the cementitious host matrix. So some have been included as additive, additives, some are partial replacements, some positioned within the prisms, and some included in bulk and some apply as coatings. We use multiple techniques for the characterization and imaging of the materials and products themselves, and when they are placed within the cementitious matrix. Particular areas of focus have included sustainability during the mixing process. For example, do the microcapsules remain intact? Good distribution within the mix, particularly when working with nanomaterials. And then effectiveness of the bonding with the cementitious matrix, which obviously governs the triggering mechanism. We've also used those techniques to follow the triggering and the self-healing process. So looking at rupture mechanism, crack closure, release of cargo or rebar corrosion. In terms of laboratory testing on the cementitious samples, this clearly starts with the introduction of the damage, so crack initiation or exposure to aggressive environments, cyclic loading, aggressive chemicals, freeze thaw, and others. And then we carried out specific tests to monitor 
um, and assess the recovery and progress and performance of the healed material. We tested compressive strength, fractional strength, sorptivity and permeability, electrical resistivity, chloride ingress, and a range of corrosion related tests. And we usually combine a mix of conventional and bespoke tests, and we've also uh, used non destructive testing. And as part of a European cost action project, SARCOS, we carried out round robin inter laboratory tests. And the purpose was to standardize test methodologies and unify our approaches to self-healing and cementitious systems across the many labs involved. And we used a number of mineral additives and encapsulated agents. And we have been fortunate to be able to carry out a number of field trials and commercial deployments. So as part of the M4L project back in 2015, uh, we all as a team worked together with Costain and constructed a number of retaining walls with different healing systems. And these were cracked in the same way and then their self-healing performance monitored. One wall contained microcapsules and we have retrieved cores that we've been testing over time. We carried out two commercial deployments. So again, back in 2015, one of them was part of the new extension to our department of engineering department uh, Cambridge and working together with the contractor Morgan Sindel we produced 200 concrete blocks to replace commercial ones and these were made with a range of different self-healing materials and products including mineral additives and encapsulated agents as well as a range of low carbon cements and we recently performed non-destructive testing on those blocks. More recently in 2018 and as part of the construction of our new civil engineering building in West Cambridge, and in collaboration with the contractor SDC, we installed two outdoor reinforced concrete slabs, which contain self-healing microcapsules. The, su the successful implementation of those commercial deployments was very much down to the two contractors, who were very proactive and very keen to be, to in to be involved in demonstrating research innovations. And they were able to provide alternative solutions to us when we were not able to perform specific uh, required tests. And talking a little bit about the future, we are just about to embark on a very exciting 15 million pound initiative on roads and the road network, together with National Highways and Costain. This is made up of two projects. One is an EPSRC Prosperity Partnership and the other one is a European co-fund fellowship program. So in this huge collaborative initiative, we plan to make road materials smarter and able to provide more value. So self-sensing, self-healing, multifunctional, climate resilient, and many more. And at the higher level, therefore, there will be healthier materials, so to speak, and also aware of the state of health and able to communicate that to their corresponding digital twin and robotic systems. Our goal is to deliver a smart, digital and sustainable transformation of the road network and enable proactive and sufficient and efficient maintenance management. So we're going to be focusing a lot on roads. And as Diane mentioned, um, last but of course not least, all this work would not have been possible without all the amazing contributions of all the Cambridge researchers, both past and present. And I would like to thank them all for their contributions and involvement. I know quite a number of them are presenting at the conference today and uh, in the next three days, and we'll be providing a lot more details about their exciting work. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so um, on the same theme, I would like to um, give a brief overview of um, some of the work we've been doing here at, at, at Bath. Just going to give myself a, a laser pointer. Um, so here are the activities that here at Bath, the activities that we've been doing have been largely focused on bacteria-based um, self-healing and also on self-sensing um, technologies. Where these activities fit generally within the overall program uh, as, shown, as shown here, with bacteria-based self-healing uh, an integral part of, of research theme one and research theme two, 
and our self-sensing being an integral part of research theme three. Before I describe some of these activities, I actually want to upfront say um, many thanks to the to the brilliant team that we we have at Bath. So so here they are, and I've I've included both the the academic staff, uh, the postdoctoral researchers, and the PhD students that have been involved with the work. So. Uh, Thank you all. You've, you've all been great, fantastic, brilliant. Um, however you want to say it. Obviously, this doesn't also include. We could have. I could have also included many undergraduate students and many taught MSc students as well. We've also contributed in in many ways to some of the work that um, we've done here at Bath. So let's start with some of the work we've been doing around optimization of bacterial growth for. Um, for what we call microbially, microbially induced calcite precipitation based self-healing of concrete. Um, this is an area where we've been working quite extensively um, and obviously I can't show everything that we've been doing but I'm going to explore um, some quick examples of work that we've been doing which involve uh, fundamentals of bacterial growth, healing in colder conditions and genetic engineering. So one of the first things that we were quite keen to do in our infrel was to get a, a broader understanding of the capability of bacteria to precipitate calcium carbonate. So we surveyed our local environment for bacteria and actually we we're very fortunate in Bath to be uh, very close to many calcium rich sites such as exposed limestone and uh, also caves and soils that are in areas with a limestone bedrock such as the Cotswolds and the Mendip Hills for those that know the UK. There, we, we largely targeted spore formers that could tolerate alkaline conditions, which are obviously typical of, of concrete. Uh, and preliminary isolation identified most of our 135 isolates as, as bacillus. But we were also able to distinguish our bacteria into ones with urolytic capability and those that didn't. And this allowed us to investigate which pathway was the most relevant to providing self-healing applications. We found that in terms of self-healing of concrete, both the ureolytic and non-ureolytic bacteria that we used were capable of closing cracks. But interestingly, we, we found that the non-ureolytic bacteria, at least in the conditions that we tested them, worked slightly better. So we got slightly greater healing here than we, than we did with the ureolytic ones. This was to some extent a surprise, but it meant that it meant that this was the pathway that we were then able to largely proceed. Uh, and I know by, by Bianca is going to say much more about the, this, this work we've done on environmental bacteria in, in, in session five. Uh, Abia has already referenced the M4L site trial. And um, we, in, as part of this site trial, we demonstrated a bacteria-based self-healing concrete uh, in real environmental conditions. And to be honest, we've got to be honest, it was slightly less successful than, than we hoped. But we always suspect that this was actually the main contributive fact, the main contributory factor to that was that was temperature. And indeed, the, the average temperature was around about seven and a half degrees centigrade um, throughout the site trial. Whereas the bacteria that we use actually have never been known to be active below 15 degrees centigrade. So we've taken a long look at this aspect of performance. And this slide here shows um, bacteria-based self-healing of cracks in, in, in a mortar at both 20 degrees C and seven and a half degrees C using one of our normal mesophile bacteria, um, Bacillus coni. What you can see is that the, uh, the healing was you know, superb at, at, at 20 degrees C, but less than satisfactory at, at seven and a half degrees C, which basically confirms what we what we thought was was happening. So consequently, one of the things we've done with our library of 135 isolates is to try and identify one that's capable of sporulation and precipitation in minimal media <coughs> at low temperatures. And one of these, which we've named Psi 39 for, for reasons I'm not aware of, although the Psi were referred to being a psychotrophic bacteria, why 39? I have no idea. But anyway, this, this one has demonstrated effective healing at low temperatures. So this is again seven and a half degrees centigrade, and we can actually get healing at this temperature with this bacteria, which of course is very promising and means we've got something that we can take forward to, to site trials where the temperature may be lower than, than, than what we normally use in the lab. 
and uh, you'll hear more about this from Lorena in, in session six. Now something a little bit different. When we wrote the RM4L um, proposal, we did have some concern that we wouldn't be able to find bacteria suitable for all the conditions in which healing might be needed. So for example, we wondered whether we might need to actually find a bacteria that worked and thrived at low temperature, but in itself didn't have any ability to precipitate calcite, and that we would need to give that bacteria the ability to, 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 to precipitate calcite from another organism, so basically genetically modi modifying organ um, organisms. So our um, microbiology team has had a look at the gram-positive model organism, Bacillus subtilis, W168, which itself has low intrinsic UAE's activity. It's poor at precipitating calcite. But we've used this as a chassis and then added to it uh, various genes from a better calcite precipitating organism, which is Bacillus paralichiniformis. Now, obviously there's no time to look at all of the results, but what we can do is look at, show that by adding these genes, uh, you can get an increase in neurolytic activity. So for example, here, this shows the basically activity of the bacteria. And in red, you've got Bacillus paralichiniformis, and in green, you've got this particular stuff, obviously, which is really poor. And what we can do here is by adding the UAE's genes to this green one, you end up with these brown, black, and blue genetically modified bacteria, which actually work better than both of the natural bacteria, which, of course, is, is very promising. But also what's really interesting is that when we looked at the calcite precipitation ability of both of these genetically modified bacteria, it was really interesting to see that the morphology of the calcite that they precipitated depended on the genes that they contain. So that really gives an insight into what's going on at a fundamental level in terms of calcite precipitation. Finally, I'm just going to say a little something about the self-sensing work that we've been doing in research theme three. In this work, what we've been trying to do, as Diane explained earlier, is try to develop concretes that recognize that they have cracked. And the intention is then to get concrete to trigger healing reactions when the form of healing that you're using wouldn't do that automatically. So the example, for example, is shape memory polymers, as, as described by Diane earlier on. We've tried to generate this um, self-sensing technology through two means both based on the electrical properties of the concrete. External sensing using piezo sensors and through intrinsic sensing using carbon-based powders and, and fibres, similar to what they've been doing at Cambridge. This, this slide shows sort of typical piezo sensors uh, and how we attach these to the concrete externally. We then crack the concrete and, and if necessary, we can also simulate healing by using compression. As we load the specimens, we then measure the impedance response as it changes from a pristine stage as shown in black to a crack stage as shown in, in red. Now on the face of it, <laughs> look at these slides, on the face of it, there doesn't seem to be much, much difference occurring. You know, the, the changes are very, 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 very subtle. But actually with some quite innovative analysis and computation, you can read quite a lot into these responses. And it's very clear actually you can see exactly when the concrete must have cracked, which would then for, be able to be logged it, put into an algorithm to actually uh, get this automatic healing. I'm not going to say anything more because we're actually in the process of, of publishing this work and I need to just hold back until it is actually published. Uh, we're at the minor correction stage for publication at the moment. But based on that, we're now working with Cardiff and Bradford to actually use this technology in combination with shape memory polymers. So the intention is, of course, that the PZT sensors will detect the cracking, and then this will trigger through the algorithm I've just discussed, the shape memory polymers to close the crack. Uh, or Sam is gonna say a little bit more about his work with PZT sensors in, actually very soon, in, in, cause he's up in, session, up in session one. So there you go, that's just a very quick summary of just, just some of the work that we've been doing 
um, at Bath. And now I'm going to hand over to, to Tony, pass the baton to Tony. I can stop. Thank sharing. you very much, Kevin. And, so, and thank you to all my friends and colleagues who have presented so far. So you can see it says there, I'm going to say a little bit about some of our numerical work and then give one slide on the prospects for the final year of RM Pharrell. Um, I've worked most closely over the four years with Brubeck, or five years nearly, four and a half, with Brubeck Freeman. Uh, I've given Brubeck's presentation there. That's in a lot more detail about this, this, this model. But I'd also like to acknowledge others. Di has uh, sort of given an overview of our whole team here in Cardiff. But uh, people who've done experimental work that are fed into this or are doing numerical work. So this Thamish, sort of former PhD student, Sina, current Smartinx PhD student, Christina, uh, postdoc, doing lots of wonderful work on mini vascular networks and much else besides look out for a presentation. Uh, Diane, I, I need to say no more, and Yulia Mihai, who works with me quite closely. So overview, right, he says, trying to get the next slide to come up without okay that hasn't worked right there we are wonderful um going to give you an overview of our couple final element model how do we get to the sort of the basis of it i'm going to say a bit about the experimental evidence we've gathered and the modeling component just to say at this stage throughout this we've done experiments tried to understand what's going on develop the model have other experiments that we feed into so that's the kind of process and the beauty of having this wide-ranging grant something on the model components something we've done quite recently is a little bit of a sort of discrete statistical model to our, try and understand how the homogenized model for crack playing works i'll explain that and then just a little bit of value that validation and then our final slide okay so experimental evidence we did and uh Thamish did uh, quite a lot of these um he did a lot of mechanical tests so we have beams we put we use basically a vascular system because we could know pressure rates we could know crack widths um, and we could observe things at a good scale to provide ourselves with data so we looked at, um, at beams loaded at different rates with different healing configurations you know how the crack was when the healing was taking place different pressures direct tension specimens where we looked at different crack openings different healing periods Beans with some offset reinforcement to create some funny shaped cracks. And we have lots and lots of data, courtesy of Christina, really, on mini vascular networks. Um, just want to contra sort of highlight one thing with these, simple, these two simple graphs. If you look up lots of, uh, let's say, fairly traditional stuff on self healing, you will see graphs like the one on the left where something is cracked it's allowed to heal and then it's re-cracked and the crack is static in the healing period. If the crack is not static in the healing period, you get very different behavior. And this varies greatly with the rate that it's loaded. Okay, that's when the healing agent starts to flow into the crack. Okay, um, right. We got experimental evidence on healing agent transport. Um, uh, Thamish has done quite a lot of work and Diane, and various uh, people working with Diane has, have done quite a lot on this. Um, when the, the healing agents move through the crack, if it's low viscosity, actually the, the dynamic motion can change what happens at the meniscus. We had to study that. During the course of healing, viscosity can have quite an effect. Viscosity changes due to curing can have quite a change in the flow property. If you've got a crack, it's full of healing agent. It doesn't all stay there. Some of it decides to migrate into the microcracked uh, porous network around it. So we need to know how that works. So we did these uh, these sorption tests sort of through a cracked face. Curing front tests, these have been important to us to understand how curing takes place next to a cementitious, either concrete, mortar, whatever, substrate, and that really, without that experimental evidence, we would have gone down a very different line in creating a model that has crack opening and crack rate dependency and uh, how the capillary sort of move as it goes up a crack. Uh, this is a sorption test. And this one, this little graph here comes from 
if you look at what curing takes place over time next to a substrate, this is the degree of cure time one, time two, time three. That's important to what we do. Okay, uh, 148. The model. We developed some special elements, and I just say I've given a whole load of references at the end because much of this has been published with um, embedded destruct, uh, strong discontinuities. If you do modeling, um, you'll know what that is. If you don't, uh, you imagine having a finite element and you sort out the kinematics of a crack across it. We have come up with a new form of cohesive zone damage healing model. Now, you will see many models that have something like traction is one minus damage parameter, no damage, no dam fully damaged one, stiffness, relative displacement, amount of healing, stiffness of the crack material, relative displacement, something to represent the cured material in the crack. Now, this form and fa fairly similar forms of equation have been used by many. The challenge is how to actually get the evolution of this thing and this thing, not so easy. I'll say a bit more about that. And uh, the curing front model where we have, we, we learned how curing takes place and we actually track this developing curing front. And then when solid material percolates across the crack, that's when healing is detected. And by taking this approach, we've been, as I've said just now, naturally able to simulate sort of crack opening dependency, crack rate dependency. Okay, what a full slide. Brubeck's gonna talk about the flow, a bit about the mechanical, but a lot about a flow in a great deal of detail. So I won't uh, go through the equation. I'll just say, we do have to model the flow in discrete cracks. We use it with Cut FM, Navier Stokes. See Brubeck's brilliant presentation coming up, okay? Matrix flow, fairly standard Richard's equation, but we have to take account of viscosity changes. I mentioned viscosity changes, so there they are. We've used various models. I've highlighted something called Einstein's suspension model here. Dynamic flow, um, a sort of capillary flow. When that happens, and I've said this, it's fast enough, the meniscus angle changes, so we need to take account of that and there's the capillary number where the velocity term sits there. And we've also, over the last year or so, put a reactive chemical transport so we can model a wider range of processes. Okay, this is some of the most uh, recent stuff we've done, and this is all to do with this. Now, imagine you've got a crack. There are, uh, it's concrete, and uh, you can see here two holes where a healing agent has been fed in. And the brown bits are where it's recracked, and you can see healing agent was, and the other bits are where either the crack's gone somewhere else or, um, or the healing agent didn't quite get there. In this case, it's where the crack's gone somewhere else. Now, if you went through each one of these little blocks and measured the strength of it, first off, before it cracked, and then after it had cracked, you'd get a kind of statistical distribution of cracking, okay? So, if instead of 100 or wait, 64, I've gone with a chessboard, okay? I think I've gone with a chessboard, 64 there. If you imagine that's a few thousand and you break this into units and you range the strength of those in the order of strongest is greater than weakest, okay? With increasing C, okay? And then we relate that to a relative displacement parameter through a stiffness, okay? So that gives us a kind of statistical model then if we plot those statistical strengths or relative displacements of fracture, uh, one is everything. Z omega, that's where it's cracked to at a particular time. HV is where the healing's kind of got to. No, that's the sort of maximum C position the healing's got to. And then under that, we've got rehealing virgin materials. And just say, why did we do this? Because we wanted a rational way to come up with a homogenized model for crack healing, keeping an eye on the time. Um, so if you integrate the behavior of this across uh, a crack plane, you get that, and you can turn that into a summation term where you have lots of discrete elements that are, might either be uncracked, uncracked, first damage, virgin damage, virgin healed, re-damaged, re-healed, okay? Take that model and um, take that model, apply a constant displacement rate, 
at a particular time, damage to here, that's, that's everything. That's where the sort of virgin healing front's gone to. This is re-damaged. Look at a bit later. Okay, you've got this rehealed material, rehealed material, and there's the sort of virgin healing front. There's the damage front. Keep going. And depending upon the different things, you find this material, the healed material and redistributed, re-damaged material distributed throughout the region. And you get the sort of formation of these waves, a bit of artifact of the way we do it, but nevertheless, it, it is what it, what it is there. Okay, so I'm going to have to do this quite quickly because I see the time. We've come up with some homogenized healing variables based upon our observations and then looked at do we achieve the same response, average stress, normal displacement, as the, I've called it ligament model, the statistical discrete damage model. And yes, we do stay within the envelope of that. Okay. And I won't go through the numerics of it, but that has been very important to stop us guessing on how we come up with these homogenized variables. Okay. So um, we put that model together, everything there. And uh, if we look at something with a discrete crack, Okay, we replicate that behavior. Then we tested a constant crack op opening sort of displacement rate. Different rates have different behaviors, fair sort of variation within experiments, but our numerics are pretty much always within the green dotted line. And this is load versus crack knife open displacements within that range. Um, here we've got some more interesting crack patterns we've looked at, some curved cracks and double cracks, and Brubeck's going to show some 3D results. Okay, so the final year, okay, this is, we call this the Buzz Lightyear slide because it's RM4L, current, and uh, to infinity and beyond, okay? So if you're of a certain age or have children of a certain age, this might make sense to you. If not, you really should watch Toy Story. Okay, right. Anyway, the final year of RM4L, a lot of work on scaling up. A lot of our technologies are coming to fruition. We've been doing scaling up, big focus for the last year. I've listed the range of technologies. We are moving in on various fronts onto some site trials and a lot of help with Highways England. Uh, a beer mentioned the project, National Highways and Sustains focusing on road applications and uh, bacteria systems. A linked project we've had is with Newcastle and North Northumbria Water Group, and uh, we're going to do some, hopefully, some site trials on that. Sustainability is a big focus. With our systems have to work with low carbon concrete, and uh, the concrete industry is a problem to the world, but we have the solutions as a community, so we hope. Okay, but we can expect a lot of scrutiny over the next few years from politicians and people. Life cycle assessment, very important. Will our things go on? We need to improve our biometric technologies. An awful lot of science has been done and is still going to be done in the remaining part of RM4L and follow-on contracts. And um, I've said a bit about modeling. I believe a great deal in modeling. It's very useful. If you don't do it, consider it. Okay. There's a few references, which uh, most of which have been published. We've got one under review at the moment and others in draft. Um, so that's it for me. That's the end of the presentation for RM4LC.